My name is Keely, and today we're going to be going over the basic operations of a mill in the machine shop. A mill is one of our most versatile tools. It allows us to do a lot of machining, and um, it's very important that we are safe around it, and that um, as we use it correctly, we can make a lot of stuff that we normally couldn't make. So we like the mill. Um, I wanted to go over some brief vocab, just get you a head-to-toe definitions of the mill, and then we're going to go over each item specifically and talk more about it. Looking at the mill, we have labeled the different parts so you can understand what they do. Um, looking at the head and the top, first we have up highest we have the forward off slash reverse and underneath that we have the spindle brake. There's also the drawbar control toggle, quill auto feed controls, quill micrometer depth stop, spindle with drill chuck, and on the other side there's a variable speed wheel handle high low gear switch, digital readout or DRO, quill feed handle, quill lock, and the collet, chuck, and tool rack. As for the knee and table of the Bridgeport mill, there is the vise, x-axis handle, which controls the table, the table lock, which locks the x-axis, and then there is the z-axis handle, or the knee, and the y-axis handle, or the saddle and the saddle lock, which locks the y-axis. So, to start, you want to grab your, your piece. I am milling this beautiful little piece of aluminum. Um, so it's very important you want to grab parallels. The reason we use parallels is it allows us to raise our, our, our material or our work piece up so that we can machine it better. If you see, I take this tiny piece of aluminum and I put it right here. Let's say I wanted to mill it down to a quarter of an inch thick. It's, not going to be very fun at all, and it's going to we're going to be dangerously close to the vise, um, which we don't ever we don't ever want to run our tool into the vise. So we use parallels, and we want to make sure it's clean so that they sit parallel. The purpose of parallels, why they're called parallels, is their machine ground um, or surface ground to be exactly parallel with each other, so our piece is perfect. We want to move our vise away from our spindle. And then back here, every mill has a set of tools right over here. So we grab our hammer and we use it to like basically hit it, tighten it down, make sure it is flat on top of the parallels. When you're done with this, you should be able to you shouldn't be able to move the parallels up and down, but only and like side to side maybe a little. But the important part is not up and down. And we'll tighten it all the way with our wrench here. Just like we said to not hit the vise, it's also important not to hit the parallels. You never want to drill into the parallels, so sometimes you might need to put a parallel in the middle of your part instead of on the edge if you're drilling a certain, like, holes into the side of a plate. Um, and it's also important to keep your hands away from the spindle and the tool at all times. So you want to make sure that you set up your tool in the best way possible. You don't have to be holding it in some way that it is self-sufficient. Um, I guess the way you machine is you just use the tool stays here and you're moving your piece in the X and the Y and the Z. So this is the X and these are red on the DRO. Um, using the edge finder you can set your zeros and then using your drawing you can see where all your parts are exactly. Often we like to use the locks so these are the table locks and you want to tighten them. There's two for each the X and the Y and the Z but we don't use the Z locks because the Z is so heavy. Um, you want to tighten them slowly so that you don't mess move the numbers while you're working with it. Same idea goes for the Y, the Z. You can tell which way these turn by using the right hand rule. So if I want it to turn towards me, then I go up. If I want it to turn away from me, I go this way. Um, another, if the right hand rule is too complicated for you, because sometimes we don't like to use our brains, um, just move your part away from your tool and just practice which way it goes. You'll get the hang of it. This is a Z. We keep the handle on backwards so that we don't hit ourselves in the knee. Um, and this one just goes up and down. You can tell when you're going up and down on this one. Up is counter, up is clockwise and down is counterclockwise. But you can tell easily that there is resistance when you're going up and down. It's almost like falling because the Z is so heavy. This entire area is the Z. Um, the way you zero the Z is you use this analog scale over here. We recommend, there's a lot of slop, 
for slack in our Z's. So we recommend having the handle pointed in the way you want to go. Usually it's off to the right because we're going up and then you go to zero. That way you reduce the slack and if you notice on this machine you would be one thou off if you had not done that. So you just take it off and if I went 50 thou deep with my Z, I would be cutting 50 thou here because each tick mark is a thou. The other way we can machine besides X, Y, and Z is we can use our quill. So this is the quill lock. It should be locked at all times unless you're using the quill. So you just want to lift it up and it allows you to bring this down and drill into your part. Um, what is nice about this is we have our quill stop which you has a scale on it, so you can move it by every couple thou. Or what we often do is we just press this button and it lets us move it all the way up. This is especially helpful when we're doing something like a counter bore, where we want all of them to be to the same depth. And so I'll set my depth stop at the depth I want my counter bores to be, so they're all uniform. But when you're done with the quill, make sure you have it in the raised position and down. Often, if you're getting it, if a tool won't come out for you when you're doing a tool change, it's because you've left the quill down. This was more obvious when we didn't have the power draw bars because you wouldn't even see um, the draw bar at the top, which means you can't change it. Because right now it's lowered into the machine. It's here instead of up here. So it has to be up at the top and locked. Some people will put the stop right at the top to make sure that they don't, um, that the quill does not move on them. Because you don't want to be machiney and then the quill just start dropping and all of a sudden you've taken off 50 more thousand than you meant to. As for tool changes, they're fairly simple. The first thing you want to do is grab a collet. So every end mill is a different size, a different shape, diameter, and you just come over here. Every mill has a set of these, and you find the end mill, the quill, the collet. I'm sorry. That fits your particular end mill. They're fairly easy to tell. You'll know if you get it wrong, and then you'll know if you get it right. They fit perfectly with each other. So I have a half inch shank, so I have a half inch collet. And the way you do this is you sit here and spin it until you find the keyway. The keyway is emphasized here. Once I have it, you push it. So once I have it, I hold it up with my fingers, and then I press in, and now the machine is holding on to it. Same way goes for getting it out. You press in and out. Uh, you got to be careful because these two things aren't connected, right? So sometimes um, this will drop and stab you if you're not. You need to make sure you're holding onto both of them. I like just holding like this. But um, same goes for the Jacobs chuck. It's the only collet that we would consider different, just because you don't need. I don't need to put my drill bit in it when I'm putting it in the machine. But since drilling is quite a height. We need to lower the Z before we put it in. This is what a Jacob's check looks like. There's one on every mill. It's just a drill chuck, but it has its own keyway and call it attached to it. That's what this part is. And so I'll come over here and I'll stick it in. I'm still holding it by the bottom the same way I do the other one. Now it's sucked up in there. I didn't lower this far enough. Jacob's check is not only used for drilling, but we also use it for tapping. It will hold our spring tap very well. Um, But now that it's in there, I can just tighten this in that. I want to make sure it's straight. And then you grab your chuck key and you tighten it. The other way you can do this is you, and then just take it out, you can take this out. This is nice when you're drilling lots of holes of different sizes, just because you don't have to do a tool change every time, which adds a lot of time to your machining process and just allows you to take a drill in and out. You should not use the Jacobs chuck for an end mill. Um, even though it might seem easier, it's not made for that, or the end mills are made for that. 
As for speeds and feeds, it's always very important that you go the speed and feed optimal for your a type of material and your machining um, purpose. So first thing you want to do is you want to look at what gear the mill is in. Over here you have a high, a neutral, and a low gear. Right now I'm in high and I can tell that by taking my finger and I can't, I can't pull it. Um, and I'm not pulling hard, I just wanted to see if I can move it with one finger. If I can do that, if I can move it, it's in neutral, it's not quite in high. And the way you can check is you see if you can spin this. Sometimes it's hard to spin it in high gears. Um, but since it is, is in high gear, I turn it on to high. Now my machine is running, and I can change the speed. You should never change the speed when the machine is off. It will ruin the belts inside of it. So I'm going to set my machine to 600. That is an optimal speed for most machine purposes, especially for this piece of aluminum here. As I mill it, that's the speed I want to go with. Um, if you turn it on to low while you're in high gear, nothing really happens except it spins backwards, which will cut backwards, but our tools aren't made to cut backwards. And so you just need to remember high for high, low for low. To switch it into low gear, I sit here, I press it into neutral, and then I press it again into, into low. It should click into place. I, should, I shouldn't be able to move it with my hands, but I should feel that I could if I was stronger. Um, turn on to low. You can hear the difference in that speed as the other one. Because now that one's running at about 75. To put it back, and this is where most people mess up, is right, once I hit it, it goes almost to high, but it's not quite there. And so I just turn this, and it goes into high gear. You'll be able to tell if you're not in gear as, it, as the machine starts screeching at you as you can hear the gears grinding. So if that happens, turn it off immediately and double check your gears. Um, this is the brake, so I can turn something on and I can stop it faster with the brake. Um, a couple of them are worn out on the machines, but they all work and they're all very useful, so don't ever be afraid of using the brake. Um, as for cleanup for the machine, we over here at the Collins, there's a little paintbrush. We expect you to wipe up all your chips off of this and off the table and the saddle onto the floor. Go grab a broom and a dustpan and sweep it all up into a garbage can and leave the machine looking nice and clean um, and ready for the next person to use it. Um, thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed this video.